You know, one of the hallmarks of the Christian understanding of God is that God is a God who speaks. That God is a God who has revealed himself to humanity through the works of his hands and through the words of his mouth. And he's done this in history through many supernatural means. And he's done this in order to reveal his purposes, his wisdom, and ultimately the plan of salvation that culminates in his son, Jesus Christ. And Christians believe that this revelation from God that came from God in history was then inspired and written down, and we have it now in the form of the Bible. So Christians believe that the whole Bible, both the Old and the New Testaments, are revelation from God. Where the Bible speaks, God speaks. Therefore, since the Bible is revelation from God, where the Bible speaks, God speaks, um, for Christians, the Bible is their ultimate source of faith and practice. It is the bedrock of their faith. While people can claim to, to have private revelations from God, the Bible is the one true and trustworthy source of revelation from God. However, why do we believe that the Bible is God's Word? What reasons are there to believe that this document here, that the Bible is actually true and trustworthy revelation from God? Well, that's what I want to have a look at this morning in the last of our God questions. And I want to first look at some object objective reasons to believe that the Bible is God's Word. Now, when I say objective reasons, what I mean is some reasons outside of the Bible that come from outside of the Bible to believe that the Bible actually is the Word of God. And the first objective reason I want to give you this morning is I want to give you this reason, is because archaeologists, archaeology confirms the truthfulness of the events of the Bible. You see, the Bible is different from what many people think that the Bible is. Many people, I think, they come to the Bible and they think it's a little bit like Aesop's fables, that it's full of all this good information and wisdom. But the Bible is different from what we expect. While the Bible does contain wisdom literature, what the Bible, the, the message of the Bible comes within a historical narrative. And this historical narrative means that the events of the Bible can be scrutinized. For example, did Abram, Moses, David, Solomon, Peter, Paul, and John really exist? Did the Israelites really live, leave from Egypt and head over to Israel? Um, were there peoples like the Hittites, the Peshazites, the Jebusites in the ancient Near East? You see, if the Bible is true, then what you would expect is you would expect to find that outside sources of the Bible verify the historical details that we find in the Bible. And what we find is that rather than the Bible being a made-up story, many archaeologists take the Bible as a serious historical source. For example, archaeologist Stephen Oret states this. He says, serious scholars, even if they're not believers, even if they do not think the text is sacred, note that, even if they're not believers, even if they don't think the text is sacred, they still consider it to be history because it matches up so well with the evidence they see. Another archaeologist, Dennis Bailey, notes that the historical material in the Old Testament must be taken with great seriousness. It is the primary evidence for the history of the time, and no honest historian or archaeologist should treat it as anything but. In fact, many archaeologists acknowledge the fact that you can't do archaeology in Israel without the Bible. You know, the same is true for the New Testament. Many people don't realize this, but they don't realize that there are other sources outside of the Bible in history that confirm and speak about Jesus, and you would expect as much. If Jesus was such a great hist uh, figure in Israel at the time, you would expect other people to have talked about him. And you have um, historians like Titus Fla Flavus Josephus, who was a Roman historian who lived in the first century. He was born in 37 AD, and he lived slightly after Jesus. And he wrote a history of the, Jew, uh, the Jewish people, the antiquity of the Jews. And in chapter 9 and verse 1, he says this, The chief priest assembled the Sanhedrin of Judges and brought them before the brother of Jesus, who was called the Christ, whose name was James and some others. And when he had formed an accusation against them as breakers of the law, he delivered them to be stoned. So we can see that Josephus a Jewish historian of the first century mentions Jesus and his brother James, and he calls, it, he calls Jesus the Christ. So I think that this proves at the very least that historical sources outside of the Bible point to its truthfulness. 
It may not convince you alone that the Bible is of divine origin, but at least it convinces you that its events are actually truthful. And if the Bible was written by a God who is truthful, then what you would expect is you would expect it to contain information which is truthful, which is exactly what you find from archaeology. The second objective reason to believe in the truthfulness of the Bible is that not only does it contain archaeology that is truthful, uh, not only does archaeology confirm the truthfulness of the Bible, but also it contains hundreds of fulfilled prophecies. You may not realize this, but the Bible contains hundreds of prophecies. Prophecies that in earlier biblical revelation predict events that happen later in history. Now, prophecies, these prophecies in the Bible are not like the prophecies of Nostradamus. Every now and again, you'll be watching, you know, the news and you'll see, you know, an article about how Nostradamus predicted like this event or this event or this event. And when you read the prophecies of Nostradamus, you realize that Nostra Nostradamus predicted things that were so vague that you could read any event to be a fulfillment of his prophecies. But the Bible prophecies are not like that. The Bible prophecies are quite specific. For example, in Ezekiel 26, Ezekiel predicted that the city of Tyre would be destroyed. Now, in Ezekiel's time, the city of Tyre was a thriving port city, and no one expected it to be destroyed. But it happened exactly as Ezekiel had predicted. It was destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar, and then further destroyed by Alexander the Great. Or another example is the length of Israel's captivity. Israel were taken away into captivity by the Babylonians, and in um, uh, Jeremiah 29, verse 10, Jeremiah predicted that this would last for 70 years, and it happened exactly as Jeremiah predicted, something that the exiles could not engineer themselves. However, the most remarkable prophecies that you will find in the Bible are concerning Jesus. For example, the virgin birth of Jesus was predicted by the prophet Isaiah in Isaiah 9, verse 6. The place of his birth was predicted, Bethlehem, in Micah 5.2. The fact that he would come riding in on the colt of a donkey into the city of Jerusalem was predicted in Zechariah 9.9. But probably the most remarkable prediction that was fulfilled about Jesus was the way that he was to die. In Isaiah 53, we see a picture of the way that Jesus was to die. And I want to challenge you, if you're a skeptic here today, just read Isaiah 53 and ask yourself, how can you not but help see this as an image of the crucifixion of Jesus? You see, if the Bible is truly revelation from God, then this is what you would expect. You would expect if it makes prophecies that those prophecies would be fulfilled in history, which is exactly what you see. However, not only does archaeology point to the truthfulness of the Bible and fulfilled prophecies point to the truthfulness of the Bible, but also you see its preservation points to the truthfulness of the Bible. You know, one of the objections that many people have to the Bible is they say something like this. They say something like this. They say, you know, the Bible that you have in your hands can't be the Bible that was originally written by the original authors of the Bible. It must have been changed over time. Now, we know that human beings make errors, don't we? We know that human beings are prone to making errors. And therefore, since the Bible arose in a time before the printing press and before a photocopier, it was handwritten out, it does make sense that, you know, the copyists of the Bible made errors. And it is true that when the scribes copied out the Bible, they did make errors. So how can we trust that the Bible we have today is the Bible that the apostles or the other authors of the Bible actually wrote? Well, I don't know if you've ever played the game Whispers. Have, do you know that game, Whispers, where you sort of like you start, and I might whisper in um, this young lady's ear. What's your name again? I've forgotten. Elise, Elise, I might whisper in Elise's ear and then Elise whispers to Mary and it goes all the way around and then, you know, it goes all the way right to the end and, I, and then you ask the person right at the end what the message is and in the game whispers, you'll find out that, you know, the message has changed. You compare message or the message at the end to the message there and it's changed. And, and that's the way that many people think that the Bible was actually transmitted that it was transmitted in a linear fashion, like that, from one person to another person to another person. But that's actually not how the Bible was transmitted. You see, what happened is when the 
early um, writers wrote the Bible, what happened is they then made like hundreds of copies of the one manuscript. And then other copies were made, and other copies were made, and other copies were made. And what we have is we not only have the, um, we have all of these copies to compare, all of these different copies to compare, and not only do we have the later copies, but we also have the earlier copies to compare together. And, and you can go to um, universities all over the world and you can find these fragments of the New Testament. For example, this here is P52. This is Papyrus 52. It's one of the early fragments of John's Gospel. It has been dated by scholars at 125 AD, only 30 years after John penned the Gospel of John. Now that might seem like a long time to you, 30 years. Wow, that's a vast time. But what you need to know, in terms of ancient documents, it is amazing. For example, the closest document to the New Testament that has a lot of manuscripts is Homer's Iliad. Homer's Iliad has nine manuscripts. Do you know how many manuscripts there are of the New Testament? 25,000. Over 25,000, there are nine of Homer's Iliad. And Homer's Iliad, that's not Homer's Iliad, that's P52, but Homer's Iliad was written in 900 BC, and the earliest surviving manuscript of Homer's Iliad that we have is dated from about 400 BC. That's a period of 500 years. So do you understand that with the New Testament, we have many more manuscripts, 25,000 in comparison to nine, and they are only 30 years. Some of the manuscripts are only 30 years away from the original manuscript. And what we know is when we compare all of these manuscripts together, all of these manuscripts that we have, they agree on 95% of their reading. 95% of their reading they agree, and the 5% that they don't agree, most of them are spelling changes or spelling errors, and there is no major doctrine of the Christian faith that is affected by any alternative reading of the New Testament. All this has led Sir uh, uh, Frederick Kenron to write this, the interval then between the dates of the original composition and the earliest extant evidence becomes so small, so to in fact be negligible, and the last foundation for any doubt that the scriptures have come down to us substantially as they were written has now been removed. Both the authenticity and the general integrity of the books of the New Testament may be regarded as finally established. But that's the New Testament. What about the Old Testament? You may not realize this, but the Old Testament that you have in your Bibles is built upon the Masoretic text. And there is one Masoretic text. Now, what I mean by that is there are a number of copies of that same Masoretic text, but they all say the same thing. And the copy that we have is dated around 900 AD. That's some 1,300 years after the last book of the Old Testament was written. So the question comes, how can you know for sure that the Old Testament hasn't been changed? Well, there are a number of things to be noted. First, the Masoretic scribes were absolute professionals in, in um, transmitting the text. Um, when they copied, they would copy so carefully the text that they would count the number of letters on each line, and if it wasn't the same as the text that they were copying from, they would immediately rip up the page and they would throw it away. They were very, very, um, very, very expert in their copying, copying of the text. But this, for, for a lot of history, this was still up for grabs. Did the Masoretes do a very great job in, in copying the text? Well, there was a discovery, actually, in 1949, an amazing discovery that happened in archaeology. In 1949, this shepherd boy was walking along in Palestine, and he walked into this cave, and when he came into the cave, he came along some jars of stone, and within those jars of stone were scrolls of the Old Testament from the Essene community. It's called the Dead Sea Scrolls. You may have heard of that before. That's what the Dead Sea Scrolls are. And within the Dead Sea Scrolls, there were many fragments of the Old Testament, including complete books of Esther and Isaiah. And they are dated from somewhere around 300 BC to 100 AD, about 1,000 years before the Masoretic Texts. And when they compared 
those, scri those scrolls that they found with the Dead Sea scrolls, with the Masoretic text, do you know that they found that there were no major changes? That there were only slight variations, once again, in spelling and grammar. So anyone who says to you that, uh, you know, today you don't have the original text in the Bible, that it has been changed, they're just showing their ignorance. They really haven't done the homework. They really haven't looked into it. No serious archaeologist, no serious scholar at, uni at a university around Australia would actually say that. that. There is enough manuscripts and enough evidence to show that what we have that's been passed down to us is what the original authors wrote. And I believe that this preservation of the text does point to its divine origin, that God actually preserved his word. So there are some objective reasons, reasons outside of the Bible, to believe in the truthfulness of the Bible. Archaeology confirms it, um, confirms the details of the Bible. It has fulfilled prophecy within it. It also, the preservation of the text, points to the truthfulness and trustworthiness of the Bible. But now I want to look this morning at some internal reasons. I want to look within the Bible itself. What are some internal reasons to believe that the Bible actually is true and trustworthy? Well, you know, when you look at the Bible, you find something uh, remarkable. You find that the Bible has one clear and consistent message. Even though it has over more than 40 authors, over a time span of a thousand years, it has this clear and consistent message. A um, professor of biblical criticism and exegesis at the University of Manchester, F.F. F. Bruce, he rightly observed this, the Bible is not simply an anthology, there is a unity which binds the whole together. An anthology is compiled by an anthologist, but no anthologist compiled the Bible. There was no one person standing over the Bible saying we should keep this in or we should get rid of this. It was compiled over a period of time. And amazingly, when you look at the storyline of the Bible, it has this consistent story. You have creation, you have the fall, you have then the people of Israel in preparation for the coming of Jesus. And then in the New Testament, you have the fulfillment of that in Jesus. It's this amazing, consistent story that you see throughout the Bible. Further, the Bible is very consistent in the way that it pictures God. It pictures God as being triune, as being loving, as being just. It has a very consistent theology. But not only, not only do, does it have this one clear and consistent message, I think also one of the things that confounds me about the Bible is it presents uh, life in a way that is consistent with reality. Now, let me, let me explain what I mean by this. Uh, if you're an atheist, what you actually believe as an atheist is that the world came into being by mechanical processes, by impersonal mechanical processes. This is how the world was created. And so you have nothing, in, in a mechanical world, you have nothing to explain why human beings crave for meaning, why human beings need love. You have nothing to explain why, why human beings um, look for human touch. You have nothing to explain that. But the Bible actually presents that the world came into being through a personal God. And since it came into being in a personal God, we see that we are persons created in his image and therefore we long for meaning, we crave for meaning. As a human being, you can't live without meaning. You need to make meaning of your life and you crave for community, you crave for human touch. Now, I wanna ask you a question. What type of world do you see when you look out into the world? Do you see a mechanical world, an impersonal world where you don't crave for meaning, where you don't crave for personal touch and love? where there is no sense of, you don't have any sense of justice in your heart, or when you look out into the world, do you see the complete opposite of that? Do you see that you actually crave for meaning and purpose? And that when something unjust happens, does your heart rage against that injustice? I think that points to the truthfulness of the Bible, of the worldview that is presented from the Bible. I was just watching yesterday uh, 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 this clip from Ravi Zacharias, and he can say it way better than I can in a cool Indian accent. And uh, he was talking about the, the leader of the Human Genome Project. And he was saying that he's actually a Christian. And he, he, had, this, he had this slide up on screen where he, he, he showed this slide of, of one of the churches in England, which has this intricate, likely, um, intricate stained glass window where it's made up of thousands of pieces that are put together. And he said, look at that, isn't that artistry and masterful artistry and, and takes intelligence to put that together. And then he said, look at this, and he showed a picture of human DNA. And he said, look, 
look at how they compare. Like, we say that one is of intelligence, comes from intelligence, but we say that the other just comes by chance. He said after that, he got down and the band came up and they worshipped. So the only response to seeing such the greatness of God's creation is to worship him and to adore him. So there are some internal reasons to believe. But also the third internal reason is that the Bible stands alone in the field of religious literature. Now, when you compare the Bible with its other main competitors, there is absolutely no comparison. Let's quickly compare the Bible with the Quran, a, Bible, a, a, a book that is considered to be the Bible's closest competitor. Uh, now, the Quran is made up of 114 chapters. Each chapter is known as a surah, and it is believed by Muslims to be the last book of guidance from Allah sent down to Muhammad through the angel Gabriel. And like the Bible, Muslims believe that every word of the Quran is the word of Allah. But did the Quran truly come from God? Well, let's have a look at the external evidence for the Quran. Is there historical evidence that points to its truthfulness? Well, no. Iruwaka, in his book, Why I'm Not a Muslim, points out a number of historical problems with the Quran. He writes this, the account of Alexander the Great in the Quran is hopelessly confused historically. We, can, we are certain it was based on the romance of Alexander. At any rate, the Macedonian was not a Muslim and did not live to an old age, nor was he a contemporary of Abraham as Muslims contend. Well, what about the internal evidence? Does the Quran present one consistent message? Well, once again, the answer is no. You see, the Quran claims to be continuing revelation from God in line with the existing revelation of the Old and New Testaments. However, author Nathan Busness writes this, by its own admission, the Quran must be consistent with previous revelation from God, but it does not take long to see that the Bible and the Quran are not compatible. But the biggest difference, the biggest difference that I find between the Bible and the Quran and really any of its other competitors, any of the Bible's other competitors from the New Age literature of Eckhart Tolle to the writings of Gautama Buddha, is that the way of salvation presented in these books as opposed to the way of salvation presented in the Bible. You see, all of these religious books present a system of religion based upon works, a, a religious system in which the worshiper must adhere to certain works to obtain God's favor. However, the Bible stands alone in that it suggests that it is only by grace that we earn, that we come into favor with God. It teaches that God in Christ stepped down into human history and died for sinners, doing for them what they could not do for themselves. God grants forgiveness on the basis of his grace, not on the basis of people's works. Now I ask you, if you were to invent a religion, would you invent one like Christianity? Would you invent one where it's just all about trusting in God? Or would you not invent one knowing the human heart where it's about something that you can do that you can then be proud of and you can actually self-righteously look down your eyes at other people? You see, knowing the human heart, people are more likely to invent religions that they can do and feel proud of doing rather than a religion like Christianity that basically says we are all bad and we need to be rescued and we need God's grace. So I think when you look internally at the Bible, there are internal reasons to believe that Bi the Bible is trustworthy and true and comes from God. The Bible is marked by one clear and consistent message. The Bible explains life in a way that is consistent with reality. The Bible stands alone in the field of religious literature. So we see that there are external reasons, there are internal reasons, but there are also personal reasons to believe that the Bible is God's Word. One of the personal reasons to believe that the Bible is God's Word is when you look at the impact that the Bible has had on cultures, societies, and persons. You know, where would Western society be without the Bible? Our legal system is built upon the Bible. Our government is built upon the principles of equity and ownership found in the Bible. Even the way that people treat each other 
in society is built upon the golden rule, which is found in the Bible. A couple of years ago, I was watching Q&A and it had John Dixon on it, who's from the Center of Public Christianity, and he was debating an atheist called Lawrence Krauss. And one of the things that um, John pointed out to Krauss was that when you look at the history of the world, and John is a historian, you realize that science could only come into being in Western society, and that is because Western society was built upon a biblical worldview, a worldview that believes that if there is a God, this God has created the world, he must have created it orderly, and therefore if there is order in the world, there must be natural law, and if there's natural laws, those natural laws can be studied, and therefore the scientific method came into being in Western society. It did not come into being in pagan, in pagan societies where the gods are chaotic and you can never trust what they're going to do. However, more than its moral and social impact is the impact, the personal impact that the Bible has made on millions of people's lives. On one occasion, the great preacher Harry Einside, he was preaching and a person in the crowd challenged him. They yelled out, atheism has done more for the world than Christianity. W.A. Criswell, who recounted this event, he noted that the atheist then challenged Ironside to a debate. And Dr. Ironside responded to the man by saying, I'm happy to debate with you uh, tomorrow. Let's, let's do the debate tomorrow, same place, same time. Fine, said the atheist. But Harry Ironside um, added one qualifier, just one last thing. I have one last thing that I want us to do. Tomorrow, this very hour, I'm going to bring with me 100 men and women who've been saved out of the gutter, out of darkness and despair, who've been lifted up by the brightness of God. I'm going to bring 100 of them, and they are going to be standing here with me in the debate tomorrow. And I want you to bring 100 men and women who've been saved out of the gutter and out of the darkness of life by the gospel of atheism. Needless to say, the debate never happened. You see, one thing that you find, I don't know whether you find this, but one thing that I've found as I've studied the Bible is even though there are only 66 books of the Bible, you can never seem to come to the end of what they're teaching you. I have a master's degree in theology. I went to Dallas Seminary and I thought, when I go there, I'm going to get this down. I'm going to get the information down. I'm going to learn everything that I'm, I'm going to know it all so that when I come back, it was quite a proud sort of motivation as I look back now, but I'm going to know it all. I'm going to have it all down. And after, I've been, I've been a Christian now for many years, and after studying the Bible every single day, I'm finding new on, insights, new things that I've never seen. And this is because Hebrews 4 verse 12 says that the Word of God is living and active. It's sharper than any two-edged sword piercing to the soul and spirit, the joints and marrow, discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. R.A. Torrey, a great Bible scholar, he once said this. Listen to this. This is, a, this is great. Not only individual men, but generations of men for eight, 1,800 years have dug into it and given to the world thousands of volumes devoted to its exposition, and they have not reached the bottom of the quarry yet. A book that man produces, man can exhaust, but all men together have not been able to get to the bottom of this book. How are you going to account for it? Only in this way that in this book are hidden the infinite and inexhaustible treasures of wisdom and knowledge of God. You see, this book is not just this dead book written by men. It's this alive book written by God that gets us in touch with the living word, Jesus Christ. And you see, what you find as you journey along as a believer is that the Holy Spirit bears witness to His Word and confirms that this is the authoritative Word of God. You see, the Bible is actually a book that claims to be authored by God through the hands of men. The Apostle Peter spoke about the authors of Scripture and he said that men spoke as they were moved along by the Holy Spirit. So, the words of Scripture are the words of men, but they are also the words of the Spirit. The Apostle Paul, in the reading that we had today, he said that all Scripture is God-breathed. That word in Greek is theonoustop. It is the breath of God. It comes from God. So God superintended the human authors so that they wrote down exactly what He wanted them to write. However, 
even though the Bible is authored by God, men in their natural state do not receive the Word of God. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 2 verse 14 that the natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are folly to him, and he is not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. How does then one understand the Word of God if our hearts by nature are separated from God and we suffer from satanic blindness? Well, Paul says in verse 10 of that same passage, these things God has revealed to us through the Spirit. You see, the reason that Christians ultimately believe that the Bible is God's Word is because the Holy Spirit overcomes their human sinfulness and satanic blindness and He reveals it to them. As Jesus said in John 20, 10, verse 27, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. I wonder if you've ever heard the voice of Jesus speaking to you through God's word. You see, the Christian faith is not just a system of belief. It's actually about knowing a person. Jesus said, this is eternal life, that you may know God and Jesus Christ, whom he has sent. And it's amazing that as you go along and you hear the word of God preached, you will find the voice of Jesus speaking to you. Or as you open up the Bible, you will find the voice of Jesus speaking to you personally, into your situations and to your circumstances, right where you are. So today, I wanted to give you external reasons to believe, internal reasons, and personal reasons to believe. And there might be people here who are in different places this morning. There might be some people here and you've come along and you're a bit of a skeptic and you're investigating Christianity and I'm glad you're here. I'm glad you're here, but let me, let me just give you a piece of advice. If, if you really wanna, wanna come to believe uh, in, in the Bible, one of the things that I suggest you do is you just start reading it. You just start reading it with an open heart. Um, Martin Luther, a great reformer of the church, he said that the Bible is like a roaring lion. You just need to open the cage and you need to let it loose. And as you start reading the Bible, you will find that the Bible itself has this inherent authority. God will speak to you through His Word as you open the Bible. But by far, I think many of us here are already convinced of many of the things that I've said today. But yet, it's still very good for you to hear those things. And let me tell you why it's good for you to hear those things. It's because you might be just thinking, well, I don't, I don't have any problem believing that the Bible is God's Word. Why do I believe that the Bible is God's Word? Because my parents told me it's God's Word. But it's actually very good for you to build your faith upon good reasons, good solid reasons, because you will come in contact with people who will challenge you on these things. And you will have to maybe give a defense for your faith. But also I want to challenge you with this thought. If you are a Christian and you really believe that this book is authoritative revelation from God, that where God speaks, where it speaks, God speaks, then what should your approach be to this book? Your approach to this book should be that you are in the book. You are getting into the book daily. I was challenged by this. I watched a message by a lady called Kay Arthur about a month ago, and she was speaking at um, actually Pastor Andrew's old school at Liberty University, and she was, saying to, she was saying to a group of future pastors, she was saying, don't have a second-hand faith. As pastors, it's easy, it's easy to get my knowledge and my sermons just by listening to other people's preaching. She said, don't have a second-hand faith, have a first-hand faith. Get into the Bible for yourself. Study it for yourself. And I thought to myself, that is not just a message to pastors. That's a message to every Christian. Have a first-hand faith. Have a first-hand acquaintance with the Word. Get into the Word yourself for yourself. And so about a month ago, I just started getting into the Bible for myself. I started with first Peter, and I just started every day reading half an hour of the Bible and noting observations and writing down in a diary what the Lord was saying through me. And I know for some of us, we want a perfect Bible study method, and so we're worried that we're not doing it right. Oh, I'm not studying the Bible right. I'm not, I, I need to learn a right method. Don't worry about the method. Get on the journey of getting into the Word yourself. 
And you will find that as you get into the word yourself, your faith grows. Your heart for the Lord grows. You need what you need to understand. This has really helped me. Let me get a whole, whole heap of sermons in one sermon. But this has really helped me. So, so think about this, all right? You reap in a different season to you sow, to, you, to what you sow, all right? You reap in a different season to what you sow. Is my dad's a farmer, and farmers, they, they sow the seed in spring, do they? And they reap in autumn. I think that's right. Is that right? No, no. When do you sow? Right now. Right now. And when do you reap? Summertime. 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 But you sow, you reap in a different season to you sow. And oftentimes, you don't see any life at first when you put the seeds down into the ground. It takes a while for the seed to come up. And let me tell you something, the same is true with your engagement with the discipline of studying the Word. Not every day is going to be this awesome, wow, I got this wow moment. Some days it's just going to be, oh, that's, that's just interesting. That's just detail. Such and such begot such and such. You begot such and such. You begot such and such. It's going to be e- interesting detail to observe and to know. But the whole time you are sowing to the Spirit and, and you will reap. If you do not give up, you will reap a harvest of righteousness that will be flowing out of your life. So Christian, Christian, if you believe that this book is authoritative, if you believe that where it speaks, God speaks, you don't need some other extra revelation out there. You have it right here. You have the the answers right here. You can go to God every day, study His Word, and grow and learn in His Word. Praise God for His Word. Praise God for His Word. Let's pray.